Hello and welcome to another Ancient Warfare Magazine podcast. Uh, my name is Jasper Orthuis. I'm the editor of the magazine. With me today is a different group of people than you're used to, um, but for some of them you're used to. Uh, with me are Murray Dam and Mark McCaffrey, and we have a guest today, Brett Devereaux. Hi, Brett. Hey. Nice, nice of you to join us. Um, we're going to talk today about the introduction of mail as armor in the Roman army, uh, but perhaps we should start by you know you introducing yourself real quick right i'm brett Devereaux. i am currently an assistant teaching professor at north carolina state university i'm an ancient historian specializing in the roman army of the middle republic i also have a military history and general pre-modern world blog at a collection of unmitigated pedantry uh, acoup dot blog cool now, male in the Roman army, I think we've had an article or two about that in the past. Um, and I think maybe the readers know um, know a little bit of how it works, but maybe you can kick it back to you again and, and just sort of tell us um, real quick, what what's the, where does it come from? Where does it go? Yeah, um, so I think first it's it's worthwhile to, to talk, you know, definitions um, when we're talking about mail. Um, you know, sometimes we say chain mail. Uh, sometimes you'll see ring mail. Um, our actual sources just say mail in English. So I tend to just say mail. Uh, the Romans called it the Lorica Hamada. This is an armor of interlocking rings, um, typically in what we call a four in one pattern. So a single riveted ring passes through four solid rings around it. And then you repeat that pattern out fractally to make the whole armor. Um, and in particular, in the ancient world, we're talking about an armor that really covers um, the torso. Um, we're not yet, as you have, for instance, in the Middle Ages, we're not yet covering the legs, the lower arms. Um, the head or, or neck. It is really a long shirt of this kind of armor um, from the shoulders down to the knees, um, what again the Romans call uh, a lorica. And the crux of what I'm, I'm arguing, we, we know the Romans in fact knew that this armor was um, invented by the Gauls rather than the Romans. The Romans adopt it from the Gauls and then serve as the great popularizers of this armor, spreading it across the Mediterranean. And mail ends up being the most prominent metal body protection in the Mediterranean world from the period of the Roman Republic through the empire where of course it coexists with the more iconic, uh, but possibly less actually common Lorica segmentata as well as scale armors, and then into the European Middle Ages where it remains a very dominant, very common armor form. Um, the Romans uh, adopt this armor from the Gauls. What um, my research has been um, approaching is, is getting at the question of exactly when did they adopt this, this armor, which is our sources do not say, but we can talk about, we have, I have some guesses, we have some reasons to suppose, um, as well as what the impact of, of the Roman adoption of this armor was likely to be in its immediate aftermath when it was new to the Romans and largely unknown to their enemies. Um, and we can get into that sort of the second part of my question. So my question is, when did the Romans get it? Uh, and what did it mean that they got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it immediately uh, for Mark or Murray a reason to jump in, or shall we just start by well, think, when do they get it? Well, I know Murray, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to argue that there are there. Um, I mean, is it a, is it a controversy? Is there uh, alternative arguments about where it comes from? I, I think there has been in the past a, um, as there always seems to be a sort of a native origin theory. Um, as opposed to the idea that it's a, a Gallic introduction, or even is it actually from some other culture uh, that the Gauls get it and therefore um, it comes through in that manner? Um, is, are, is, there a, is there a sort of a, an orthodoxy, heresy kind of approach to Roman mail? I don't know that there's an orthodoxy, heresy approach to Roman mail so much as 
Uh, you know, the Romans, we know from Varro, believed they got it from the Gauls. Um, archaeology subsequent of that, and really the last 20 or 30 years or so have begun to fill in this picture, um, has started to give us a sense of exactly where it starts and where it goes, because of course we can date finds and we can see uh, mail essentially spread out. Now, I should note that that's tricky. A uh, part of the reason this archaeological evidence has been sort of slow to emerge, uh, mail is only very rarely preserved in the archaeological record, really for two very big reasons. Um, the first reason um, is that mail armor is easy to resize and repair, which means it's easy to keep using the same shirt of mail even over multiple generations, which means you don't deposit it in the archaeological mm -hmm. record. Mm -hmm. The second problem is that when you do deposit it in the archaeological record, it is an armor predominantly made of very small iron rings, which means it rusts away into nothing very quickly, or it rusts into concretions. You end up with little balls of rust and rings, which um, I think archaeologists have, you know, these days, you know what you're looking at. If you see one of those, I suspect that some early archaeologists may not have recognized what a concretion was um, and, and realized it. Um, so, we have the sort of core of our earliest male finds. We have a cluster of finds in the broader Danube River Basin, which I think to some degree comes as a surprise. The Romans say they got it from the Gauls and people think the Gauls, we think the Gauls in France, uh, modern, modern day France. The earliest finds are for the most part in, in the Danube Basin. Um, they're in Slovakia, um, Romania. Um, and they date typically to the late fourth or third century. Um, I think the earliest in this area is, is at Horny Yatov in Slovakia. And I apologize for all, any and all European listeners as I butcher the names of places uh, you can pronounce better than me. Um, so apologies in advance. Um, and then of course the very famous third century um, find at Cumesti, Romania. Um, the, the fly in the ointment in all of this um, is that there's also a very early set of finds in Denmark at Hjortbring. And the reading of that site has been and remains that these are um, warrior burials or, or ritual depositions um, reflecting Danube Basin, Central European warriors that have traveled north, perhaps raiding, trading, fighting, something, and ended up in Denmark. Um, there are no other sets of 4th century BC male finds in Denmark. Um, if there are, right, this is a question where new archaeological finds could really change our understanding. And so everything has an asterisk on it based on what we know now. I don't know that anyone is seriously arguing right now for an, a, a male origin in um, in Denmark, um, but the evidence really, I think, has pulled us to assume an origin in the Danube River Basin. Where that all gets really complex is questions of, well, what culture are these people in the Danube River Basin? We're talking about in the fourth century BC, the ethnographic literature in the Greek tradition is fairly thin on the ground at this point, uh, at, this, at this early stage. And so what we're going on is material culture. And so what we're seeing is that male emerges in a Latin material culture environment, right? A material culture environment that looks like the type site at Latin in Switzerland. And Latin material culture sites are generally associated with Gallic peoples. Mm -hmm. Of course, that gets really tricky in Eastern Europe because Latin material culture also shows up in, in sites that we know to have been culturally Thracian, for instance, um, because Latin material culture gets adopted by people who probably didn't think of themselves as, as Gallic culturally. And of course, there is no Gallic state or nation. These are different groups that saw themselves very differently in some ways, Gallic or, or Celtic is a uber category dropped on them by the Greeks and the Romans. Um, so it, it's, it's tricky, but I think what we can say is that the armor does seem to be strongly associated with Latin material culture, which seems to be associated with the Gauls. It emerges in the Latin material culture zone 
it, on the Danube, so the Eastern Laten material culture zone, um, and then travels west, um, reaching, um, it reaches sort of Southern France and the Alps in the late third century. Um, we have finds at Tiefenau, um, uh, which is not firmly dated. It's one of these where the, the archeologist has, has given a period date rather than a, a number date. So it's, you know, Laten C1, which would put it in the <laughs> broadly late third century. Um, there's another find in ville tresson in Southern France in the 220s-ish uh, BC. Hmm. Um, and uh, interestingly, also in the third century, um, we have the uh, find in, in Kirkburn, Yorkshire in England. Um, so it gets to uh, Britain uh, at about the same time it's getting to Southern France. Um, uh, rather, rather surprising. And so it seems to emerge in the Danube region and then spread out. And we have not great archaeological evidence this early, but literary evidence and representational evidence to suggest that the Galatians in their early third century romp across Greece and into Asia Minor bring it with them that il Galatian elites are wearing mail. Um, it shows up on um, this victory monument on a temple to Athena and Achae in Pergamum. Um, there's mail, which there's been an argument about, is it Gallic mail or Roman mail? Uh, Michael Taylor addresses this in an article um, and shows, I think, convincingly that it's Gallic mail, um, which I feel like should have perhaps been a little more obvious because Pergamum wasn't celebrating many victories over the Romans. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but but it is it is Gallic mail, and we know that in in 190, Livy tells us that the Galatian cavalry at Magnesia were wearing mail. Is it really mail though? Because in terms of those literary sources, it's not all. You know, it, it's it's interpretation really in terms of what exactly they are wearing when they sort of say it is Roman style armor, it is new new style armor as such. It's not you know. It, on the one hand, we seem to be very, very reliant on the archaeology here, more so than any other aspect of, of military equipment, really, because in other, other areas you can pinpoint, generally speaking, a, um, you know, a, a type in terms of what they're talking about in the literary. Here they're being very, much more generic, I mean, much more so than we, we had a chat about uh, swords previously, uh, mentioning about the you know the generic names of a sword in terms right. of how that can you know, not really pinpoint exactly what you're talking about in the typeface, but in terms of the, in terms of mail, in terms of the Galatians, they're turning up in Roman armour, in terms of, you know, again, when we're going to the epigraphic evidence, uh, again, it comes down to a certain amount of stereotyping there, and of the, you know, I think you mentioned in your article about the uh, preponderance of mail being used by the the wealthy or the upper classes, and therefore that seems to be, how can I say, a topos in the in the illustrations of the of the Republican era, that it's it's identifying a particular type of person uh, in the inscriptions rather than necessarily giving us pinpoint detail. Yeah, um, and and this can be really tricky. I mean, it's always tricky to try and correlate thing described in a text, sometimes just a name, with an archaeological mm -hmm. artifact, with a representational image, and to get that correlation right. Uh, especially, it's tricky with armor, right? Uh, we won't open the can of worms of what, in God's green earth, a katubals is. Um, but, you know, that is its own black hole of argument mm -hmm. for exactly the same reason. For, for male in the Galatian context, um, you know, there is some some interpolation of words here, right? We're relying on, on we know they have it because it's showing up in the representational mm -hmm. evidence and it's being portrayed as a way that it can't be anything else um, on the the um, Temple of Athena and E.K. Um, Appian says that the Galatian cavalry um, at Magnesia are, are cataphract, they're cataphractus, they're armored. That's kind of useless. Um, more useful is Livy, who says they're Loracatus. Um, and that's handy because a lot of the other options for armor that they might have had, if they were wearing, for instance, you know, Hellenistic style muscle cuirasses, um, that's not a Lorica. That's a thorax. 
um, right? A, 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 a Lorica for, for Livy, I think quite clearly a Lorica is, is a male shirt. That's the only really Lorica he is going to know in the late, in the late, um, first century. And so to describe them as, as Loricatus in the rest of Livy's corpus and Loricatus means male. Um, and then, I mean, you talk about the trickiness, of course. Um, then later we have the Daphne parade with the Seleucids in the 160s, which Polybius describes in a fragment. Um, and he describes a chunk of the Seleucid army as he says, organized in the Roman manner. And then he quickly follows up explicitly saying armored in male um, using the particular Greek technical term, which I don't have in front of me um, for male armor and no other kind. So to a degree, we get kind of lucky with our sources. In other cases, we're unlucky. Um, it's infuriating that Plutarch describes, I think it's Plutarch, um, the, the armor of a Gallic chieftain at, um, that Marcellus fights at, at Claustidum is just to find it, it's, it's a very fine armor and it's shining. And he doesn't say anything <laughs> about, is it, is it a breastplate? Is it scale armor? Is it male? We don't know. And, and certainly I think that it's, it's fair to sort of, um, discretion being the better part of valor there, not to make assumptions. Hmm. And, and I try not to. It's the Helen of Troy of armor. It's shining. It's bright. It's like, but she blo is she blonde? No, no, we don't know. It's shiny and bright. Well, it's blonde. I'm like no. Um, but yeah, it's well, funny. I'm saying it's mithril here, Murray. Well, 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 I think that's funny. The, the the amount of sources that talk about shining male armor or shining armor in general is quite common. That you know the I think there's a there's an anecdote of Caesar who, um, you know basically scolds his troops for not taking pride in their armor and then there is the opposite saying you know you shouldn't take pride i think it's scipio africanus you shouldn't take pride in shiny armor because it shows that it's actually not being used properly so there's there's both traditions in in the sort of the evidence about about the the appearance of armor and what what you know parade armor versus uh use, usable armor looks like right in the case of in the case of iron armor um, the shininess, of course, goes to how you're polishing it, and um, obviously iron rusts with regular use. Um, and so the the tricky thing, um, you know, rust on bronze pr creates a more or less protective layer, and the rest of the bronze doesn't rust. Iron rust doesn't work like that. If you put a giant block of iron out there, it will eventually rust all the way through. Um, in fact, the presence of rust on the surface of iron encourages more rust. So you need to be removing that or in some way protecting your iron armor from further rusting. Um, one option is any number of chemical treatments. Um, you're probably going to oil your armor in some way. Uh, we don't know how the Romans did this, though they probably did. Um, um, you, could, you could coat the armor um, it's called bluing. Um, which uh, renders the armor less shiny and uh, a darker blue color. Um, but through many cultures, someone taking care of their iron armor properly would be polishing it and oiling it, which would leave it shiny. Yeah, actually, I, I think I remember Renector saying that um, if you just wear um, a male shirt, the, 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 the rings rub over each other. That keeps them... That keeps the rust from getting too bad. It's not like like segmentata where you just have plates which will rust at, at yeah. the edges. So maybe maybe there were maybe there were there were rust uh, resistant exercises that you had to do wearing your your <laughs> calisthenics and uh, your, your lorica. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. we've got to do this move because this gets rid of the rust on this part. So you know, who knows? Yeah, I mail rusts fairly slowly if it's in frequent use uh, for exactly the reasons you describe. Um, the the reenactors I know that work with mail, um, for mail that's been out of use for a while, or I mean, it will still rust if you're wearing it because some parts of the rings face out, um, mm -hmm. that the usual thing to do is, is to agitate it lightly in sand um, because obviously it, it's very hard to polish it the way you would polish um, a sword or a piece of plate because it's all the little rings and they interlock mm -hmm. and you can't get into the spaces. And so, but agitating it in sand and then giving it a good coat of oil and then you can stick it on a shelf forever, um, pretty much. All of this is sounding like the armor is very 
uh, how can I say, well-made equipment. And I don't think we can really assume that of the ancient world, that we're going to get a lot of variety in terms of the quality, in terms of the ring size, in terms of the upkeep on it. Uh, I could imagine that, you know, in terms of the variety in, in armour, uh, it's going to be across an army quite a, you know, a range of whose armour is looking like what as such. Absolutely. Um, so the big, your big quality distinguishers um, in, in mail. Um, so the first, your sort of the line between decent and up and absolute garbage is how the <laughs> rings are closed. Um, so right, some of the rings in a mail shirt can be solid, but some of them in the construction process need to be opened and then in some way closed. And um, in the pre-modern world where they do not do spot welds with blow torches because they don't have blow torches, um, there are two real options here. Um, the bad option is what we call end abutted or butted mail, um, which you'll see on lots of reenactors because it's cheap, but it's quite mm -hmm. rare in the pre-modern world. And this is just, you bend it over um, and it, the, the open rings aren't actually held shut. They're just bent so that they close. Um, that's going to make the mail a lot less resistant to being penetrated. Um, but we do, we do see examples in depositions in Gallic contexts uh, of butted mail very rarely. I don't believe we have any examples of butted mail from Roman contexts. One of the things that you generally find, Roman mail, in terms of its style, is a little less eclectic and a little more standardized than Gallic mail finds um, in terms of ring count, construction, these sorts of things. Um, the other way to close the ring um, is to rivet it. To, to cross the two edges of the ring over each other and drive a rivet through that seals it seals it shut. Um, and this is the standard way of doing it for mail that is anything above garbage quality. The other way you distinguish quality in mail um, is in ring size. Generally speaking here, smaller is better, but more expensive. Um, and so you can have mail where, um, you know, the rings might be as much as a centimeter and a half um, in diameter and mail where the rings are three to four millimeters across, um, where they're absolutely tiny. Um, another just general caution, if you're looking at reenactors, um, most reenactors quite sensibly use very large rings for their mail um, because it's easier to put it together and it's cheaper and that's very understandable. Um, but if you look at ancient and medieval mail, a lot of these are made with very small, very fine wings and thus very large numbers of them. Um, and they would have provided better protection. I, I think some people sometimes look at reenactment mail where you can sort of see through the mail to see the guy's tunic under the mail. And they wonder how that could provide any protection. Um, you know, if you're dealing with rings that are, are smaller than a centimeter in size, the way the mail's going to fall, you can't see through it. Um, yeah, you can't. The, 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 even the gaps are, you have little rings in the gaps. Right. Because that's the connections, mm -hmm. yeah. Those are the connections. And so um, it, it, it's, you know, real hard to, there was a wonderful exercise. Um, I can't remember which, if it was the Wallace collection or the British Museum or the Tower Armory that did it, where they took a very fine piece of mail and showed they couldn't put a pin through it. Um, do we, do we know anything about how this, how exactly this um, early mail was made? Actually, somebody asked us, um, what do we know about that? Um, we know nothing. We can guess. Yes. Um, the construction process for mail at this early point is not described to us. Um, an experimental archaeologist uh, named David Sim has done some experiments trying to take armor rings we have, particularly from the Roman Imperial period, and trying to use various methods to create his own rings and seeing which methods create metals and patterns and sizes that match. And um, his, his assumption is that um, some of the solid rings were often made by stamping. So you'd start with sheet metal and then you would stamp out. You'd have a stamp that would press out your solid ring. Um, they come out somewhat flat rather mm -hmm. than being round in cross section like a wire. And then for the riveted rings, you would produce iron wire by drawing it through a draw plate, um, then cutting it, bend it around, stamp it flat, put a hole through it for the rivet, and then you join and rivet 
and this is your construction. But I do have to stress that this is all, um, uh, you know, it's, I, I think he's probably right. Um, but but it, there's that probably in front of it, right? You know, what, what do we yeah. know versus, versus what yeah. we can guess? I think what I should stress here, we're talking about its construction because this is going to be important whenever you're talking about mail. Mail can be higher quality. It can be lower quality. It can be very fine. It can be not so fine. Um, it can be well kept. It, it, it can be poorly kept. It is always expensive. From your own um, opinion, just to, I know this is you know purely speculation and whatnot, but from your own opinion, do you think that there was a different tactic in terms of the design of uh, particular mail in based on different periods, based on the weaponry that is going to be faced majority of the time by different armies, or do you think, think that that wouldn't have come? You know, it, that's taking a step too far in terms of design. So. In some in some ways, yes. So so there are some things that don't change. Um, the the ring join pattern, what's called a four in one join pattern. Um, we actually see some some Gallic mail that appears to be experimenting with six in one join patterns. Um, the Romans seem to adopt the four in one, and after the Romans through the Middle Ages, it's it's four in one um, forever. Um, and four four in one becomes standard, um, and that doesn't change. So the 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 construction of the actual sort of fabric of the mail doesn't change. Now, the shape of the mail shirts and how large they are and how they're set, that does change. One thing we note that's really interesting is the construction of Gallic mail shirts, which the Romans adopt, is that they have shoulder doubling. Um, so you can imagine, right, you have your tunic of, of mail. It starts at the shoulders. It goes to your knees. And then what the Gauls do is they add a pair of additional shoulder pads um, which seem to be um, connected to, like they have a, a textile or leather backing underneath them so that you have a layer of mail and then a layer of, of textile and then a layer of mail and then a layer of textile and then your body. Over the shoulders, um, sometimes these are two separate pads over the shoulders. Sometimes it's a sort of U-shaped cape that also covers the, the back of the neck. Um, but this shoulder doubling is something that the Gauls do and the Romans pick up, uh, which clearly expresses a desire to put additional protection on the shoulders. I think anyone who has seen Gallic cutting swords and thinking about what they could do with that strong downward diagonal strike to the shoulders can easily imagine why that extra padding hmm. is there. Um, as we get into the Roman imperial period and we look at the representational evidence, that shoulder doubling goes away. And the male that you see, for instance, auxiliaries wearing on, on Trajan's column does not have the shoulder doubling, though it is beginning to add sleeves. Um, and so there clearly is a desire to change what's protected, that like the upper arms need a little bit more, but the shoulders need a little bit less. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, as we go, like looking forward with male, as we get into the back end of the early Middle Ages and into the early part of the High Middle Ages, um, what we see is that um, there is a clear desire to cover much more of the body with mail. And so the, the male um, lorica, which in the Middle Ages we, we call habergeon, um, you know, begins to transition to the harbor. Queases are added for the legs. Complete sleeves are added. Mitts are added. Aventails are added to cover the head and the neck. And so you end up by, you can see this, for instance, on something like the Bayou Tapestry, that by say 1100, uh, a full set of mail is no longer just a long tunic that goes to the knees, but essentially a complete covering of the whole body. Um, you know, and that's obviously responding to, to, to changes. Um, not, not in Europe, but in South Asia, um, you also start to see in the Middle Ages, mail that is reinforced with plates. And so you will have a male framework and then say over the chest, um, in place of the rings, you have say an iron plate that hooks into the rings. It's like a perforated edges and the rings hook into it. Mirror plates, they're called. So there is, there is some variation in design styles based on what's coming at you and what you're thinking about it and, and the directions of attacks and the weapons you're facing. Do the, do the, does the shoulder protection come back in like the 4th century AD when you've got the collars and things like that that... Um... Certainly, you've got uh, other armor types seem to have a collar. Um, 
a sort of a collared suit of armour. I think one of the Europa, Jury Europas finds has a the collar, or is it Stutt no, Yeah. Which find is it? There's a kind of a, a sort of comes back, but more of a neck and head protection with a collar attached as opposed to the shoulder doubling that you're talking about. I have to be frank, this I couldn't tell you. Um, okay. I'm not as familiar with with male i want to say that there is a picture from dury Europus of a mailed cavalryman which seems to show him wearing something like an early aventail mm. so he's yeah, got a male hood yeah. Like graffiti yeah, yeah 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 and of course an aventail at least in later periods you know you have your male shirt and then the aventail is going to spread over your shoulders that's going to give you that double layer again over mm. the shoulders and so that may be covering the point um, you know, I have to admit, I'm I'm rather more focused on the form of the armor in the Middle Republic, um, and oh. so I, I fear overstepping my knowledge. No, 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 no. That's right. Oh, let's go back to the Middle Republic. And so, so we have this introduction of mail in the late fourth century, and it seems to spread all over Europe pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it seems to be a game changer, doesn't it? And, like it and really... then we, we all know what you know the Roman soldier at the end of the fourth century in in the way of armor. It's the chest protectors and back protector and mm -hmm. square round or you know, triple disc. Or, yeah, triple mm -hmm. disc varieties on that. And then how how did they pick up this mill armor? So um, we can't I, we can't say with certainty when when they they pick it up. Um, so what we've got. Um, is that we know that no later than the 220s, it's in their neighborhood. It's in the it, the Gauls near Rome have it. Yeah, you mentioned that, yeah. Yep. And we know that, um, you know, Polybius sets this description of the Roman armor, army where he says the first class is wearing male, and he sets this chronologically in his narrative in 216. Now, there is an enormous argument because Polybius is writing in the 160s. Is this the army of 216 or the army of the 160s? Um, I think Michael Dobson has his book on um, the Roman camps at Numantia where he addresses this question. I think fairly persuasively argues that Polybius is in fact working on the regs from 216 or at least from the, the, the late, late 200s. Um, and so this would, this would put the Romans as having mail no later than 216. Even if we throw out Polybius, um, we have a single hook that is clearly from a Roman Lorica Hamada um, from the site of the Battle of Baikula in 208. So that is the absolute latest date for the Romans to get it. Um, the Roman male fasteners, the hook that holds the two shoulder pads in place, are different stylistically from the Gallic ones. We can tell them apart. This is Michael Taylor's argument, which um, we can go into. Um, but... Um, so we can say like 208 is an absolutely hard line. The Romans have it by then. I think the obvious time for the Romans to pick it up is there's a period of fairly intense Roman military activity in Cisalpine Gaul. We, today we'd say nor uh, Northern Italy, but the Romans say Cisalpine Gaul in the 220s, um, right? Battle of Telamon in, in, in 225, um, Clastidum in, in, in 220. Um, that seems to be the logical place for the Romans to pick it up. But again, there's an asterisk here. Um, if the great guys at the Aegides Island turn up a, you know, bronze male fastener, then we're going to have to move all our dates. <laughs> um, you know, this is a situation where we've got to go with the evidence as we have it. So the Romans probably pick it up maybe in the 230s, maybe in the 220s. Um, and then they begin picking it up fast. Like it spreads through the Roman army remarkably fast, displacing other armor types. That's really remarkable. Male, like I said, is always expensive every culture shows up it's expensive uh, an individual male lorica is going to take something like 40 45 thousand rings to put together um when david sim did his experiments he estimated 2300 hours of labor to put one armor together um it's absolutely massive and so they're always expensive that expense seems to have kept male limited in gallic contexts to elites to mounted aristocrats, the kinds of guys who could afford horses. They seem to be the only people with male. They're the only people shown to be wearing male in the representational evidence. Those are the only kind of burial contexts we find male in. Um, those are the only instances where literary sources seem to reference mailed Gauls is aristocrats and kings on their horses. Um, the Romans take up this armor really differently. 
and we're first informed about it by Polybius that it's being it's being required of the entire Roman first class, which are the wealthiest infantrymen in Rome. But they're infantrymen, um, mm -hmm. and as we get into the second century, male completely overtakes all of those older, um, you know, pectoral chest protector armor types um, in the representational evidence. Um, and in the archaeological evidence, um, there's from the second century, there is only one possible example of a Roman chest protector. And frankly, I think it's misidentified. Um, and it's actually a Spanish piece of armor. It, it's an Iberian piece native to there. It's not Roman. Um, it's found in the siege camps at Numantia. So it could easily be a looted piece of armor, you know, pulled out of a, a tomb in Spain. Um, or off of a Spanish warrior, um, and so um, so the those chest protectors. Now Polybius says they exist as of two sixteen, um, so they must. Um, lower status. We always have to be careful. Low status armor is always underrepresented in archaeological finds and in representational evidence and in literary evidence. So probably the vanishing of these chest protectors is happening more slowly than our evidence would suggest given that our evidence is they exist in 216 and then nothing, just blank. Um, but it seems that over the course of the second century, male marches down the Roman heavy infantry spectrum until it has apparently completely replaced um, the other armor forms. That's really stunning given how expensive male is. What I think makes a degree of sense about this is exactly what you were just talking about with these um, chest protectors that existed in harnesses, that when we actually look at Italian armor culture, that we look at the various peoples of Italy and how they armored themselves, what we find is a set of different armoring styles, Etruscan, Central Italian, and uh, you know Southern Italian Greek, which are all distinct, but they share in common is that they're really metal heavy. Hmm. Um, you know, the Etruscans, we know, for instance, they pick up um, the linothorax, Greek textile armor, and they're like, this is great. Um, I really like this, but you know what it needs? And they just slather it in metal scales. <laughs> um, needs more scales. Needs more scales. Uh, Greg Aldretti notes this, and the scales look to be more robust, um, and they're, they're just more of them. Um, Scale-reinforced linothoraxes from Greece exist, but they're a minority type. Um, but they're a majority type in Etruria. And whereas the Greek ones, it tends to just maybe be, it'll cover the belly or the shoulders. In Etruria, it's the whole thing. They cover the whole thing in scales. Um, so they took this armor and they're like, this is great, but it needs reinforcing. Um, in, southern, um, in, in Southern Italy, where we have more Greek armor types, what we find is that really heavy Greek armor types, um, Corinthian helmets, um, greaves, ankle guards to supplement greaves, heavy breastplates, they persist for centuries longer in the archeological evidence than they do on the Greek mainland. Um, and indeed, if you look at helmets, because uh, just for reasons of archeological preservation, we always have more evidence for helmets than anything else. You know, in Greece, we see this really obvious trend between the very heavy Corinthian helmets of the archaic period that are, you know, upwards of two kilograms in mass down to the sort of Hellenistic, um, you know, Pelos and Konos helmet types that are often, you know, half a kilogram, uh, three quarters of a kilogram in weight. Um, and that lightness trend is pretty visible and pretty consistent. Um, in Italy, the helmets stay around two kilograms until the end of the second century, when their weight collapses conveniently right when our sources are telling us the Romans are switching to state issue. So the Republic seems to have <laughs> bought cheaper helmets. Uh, and so all of this goes together to suggest that uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, we could speculate, but we don't know, but heavier metal body protection seems to have been a priority in Italy long before the Romans encounter male. And so they have this culture that already expects to invest heavily in metal body protection for lots of different kinds of people. And then you give this armor that is, we can talk about it, but male is really good protective armor for this period. Um, its performance characteristics are great. 
its main limiting factor is that it's really, really expensive. And the Romans are ready for that. Um, and if so they're the, ideally positioned to exploit this stuff. If the Romans are picking this up, as you're saying, in around 220 or whatnot, why is there no um, you know, transfer of this? I mean, if, if the Romans get a hold of it, why is there no, no transfer to, say, Carthage or to the east until later on? I mean, when they eventually get it, the, the late Seleucid and the Ptolemy dynasties seem to pick it up, you know, with a bit of gusto. But it sort of seems odd that it doesn't get picked up. You know, there, there seems to be a time lag there. Right. So we can deal with those kind of separately. Um, for Carthage... Uh, the Carthaginians do seem to pick it up off of the Romans. Um, so, um, Literally, you argue. Yes, yes. Um, we are told that <laughs> Hannibal re-equips his African troops in mail. Well, we're told he re-equips them in Roman style, and we don't know what that means. Um, what we know of, of citizen Carthaginian troops and North African troops, I just can't imagine that chest protectors would have been an improvement. Mail would have been, but I don't see them going in for, for the chest protector. So my thought is that they're they're picking up mail, which will also explain why it is only the Africans that are re-equipped this way, not the non-African mercenaries. The what other about, piece. Of, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, the other piece. Of, oh, sorry. <laughs> the other piece of support for this um, is that um, the tomb of Mekipsa, the Numidian king. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say what 181 is his death date. Ugh, I'm probably getting that wrong. Um, second century. Um, he had a mail shirt buried with him. So the North Africans are picking it up um, and, and quick, right, if he has one. Obviously, he's a king, so it's fancy, but, um, but quick. Um, you know, our earliest evidence for mail in the Greek East is, is you're right, later. It's in the, it starts in the 160s and the 150s. It's very contested, right? It gets into these arguments about Hellenistic military reform and how much they're imitating the Romans, which is a whole can of worms. It is really striking because the Galatians clearly have it earlier, yeah. right? It's showing up yeah. in... In, in the artwork of Pergamum earlier as, as Galatian loot, um, and they don't pick it up. And it's a really odd and interesting question as to why the Greek-speaking Eastern Mediterranean does not adopt mail from the Gauls. It's available to them, and they don't pick it up. Perhaps the thinking was, well, the armies of Pergamum and others defeated the Gauls. Why would we need to pick it up? Our stuff was better in the end. Um, and it's only when they start losing a lot to the Romans that they're like, oh, maybe there is something to this stuff. It's interesting because I, I always sort of think of like the, the Carthaginians as being more akin to like a Hellenistic army as yes. such and having those links as such. So therefore, it would sort of stand to reason that that's the link that's going to take the idea east as such, not necessarily, <laughs> you know, wait for the Romans to start kicking your ass and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know, just a thought. Yeah, it may be the case in in part. Um, you know, there there is a significant debate with Hellenistic armies, um, right? That surrounds interpretations of the military regulations of Amphipolis as to how heavily armored the phalanx really was. And we know the first the officers, the first rank was armored, and then we get into this what is a katsubos debate. Um, but it may be that mail represented just a prohibitive expense for adoption. If if most of the phalanx was was armored in in say in in the linothorax or in textiles, upgrading them to mail may not have been in the budget for for Hellenistic but, kingdoms. But that that begs the question. So how did the Romans do that relatively quickly for a large number of people? Is it all just guys paying for themselves, or I mean, just from production, you'd think to to get an effective production of, of, of male shirts going, you have to organize this in some kind of mass production. Well, I think, so clearly, um, we, we know from our sources, it is guys getting it produced for themselves. That may actually encourage adoption. Um, if you're thinking about you're going into battle, you may put a higher value on your life than your king does. And so you may, or the Senate for that matter, so you may want to purchase the expensive armor that will save your life, whereas, you know, the bean counter up at headquarters may be like, I mean, but is, but is an infantryman's life really worth um, all, all, of this, all of this effort? Um, so that may have encouraged adoption. Um, of course, you know, part of the answer to this is we don't know. Um, yeah. We do know that the Romans are, are buying their own armor. Um, presumably, the fairly robust um, armor production industry 
that's already in Italy supporting this uncommonly heavy armor, um, you know, some of those skills and talents would be um, uh, would be relevant. Uh, it seems interesting to note here that some of the earliest Roman armor rings we find from the Lager Three at Rene Blas in Numantia in Spain, dating to 153, are in copper alloy. They're bronze. Now, this may be an accident of preservation. The old, like um, because we see in the Empire is very common um, to decorate a male shirt by having a few bronze rings in it in a pattern that would look really cool because they'd stand out. So this may be a case where it was a complete male shirt that was mostly iron and had just a few bronze rings in it to look cool and the iron rusts away and we only find the bronze rings. Mm. But it's also tempting to wonder if this isn't the smith that has been making um, chest protectors in bronze has now shifted over to making male, which he's initially making in the metal he knows. Um, and so you're getting perhaps male shirts that are in copper alloy rather than, than initially in iron. A again, that's pure speculation we don't know. And as you said um, at the beginning, it's provided that you, either you win the battle or you make sure that you can at least pick up the mail from the battlefield, you can you can keep reusing it. You can repair it, and right. Dad can gift it to his son, and well, you only I, have to I, buy it once and use it over several lifetimes. Yeah, I, I, right. have, I, have, I have images of the uh, Roman centurion very similar to the, the British uh, sergeant major. Smith, what do you call? What are you wearing? What kind of thing is this? You know, everyone else is in sort of chest protectors and one's wearing mail. You're like, oh, right. get out. You're out of uniform. Um, but the, the other... the other, But of course, uh, the, the Romans are very enthusiastic adopters of Gallic military technology. Yeah, um, well, especially, especially this is the guy I killed. See this repair hair? That's where I <laughs> um, And also, I think the other thing is, I'm, I'm going to be slightly facetious and say that the, the idea that you can make a and i know it's no longer the the sort of de rigueur to regard that the roman navy during the first punic war was copied from a crashed ship but that's what the sources mm -hmm. tell us but in almost in a similar way of this was really effective on the battlefield make this and right. go from there and that that sort of pre-industrial industrialization mechanism within rome of going yes we now make these we we right. go to town on on creating these shirts and you know they'll sell like hotcakes through the 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 young roman aristocrats who don't right. want to be killed uh you don't, so, don't want to die yeah don't want to die you know a great uh, motivator. You, can, you can see the spruiking on the street <laughs> um, uh are you afraid of you know downward thrusts from and they all Gallic die in swords. 216 anyway well yeah and, 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 and the whole stock of shirts goes right. to Carthage or at least to Hannibal's army it's right. and then they had to again. <laughs> but at least they knew economics. how to do it by then yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. the other the other potential advantage in terms of how do you get all of these produced um is that of course the Romans spend the the 220s not just fighting Gauls but but beating Gauls like they're moving into Cisalpine Gaul and they're winning um, obviously we know the way ancient slavery works. Um, you don't just enslave know nothing farmers. Um, you're taking captives. You may be taking skilled laborers. So the Romans may very well be bringing back Gallic mail makers. And the thing about the labor for mail, now the labor time is massive, but a lot of that time is punching rings out of sheets and making wire, um, and just forming the rings. And that's semi-skilled labor. And so you can bring back your one, you know, Gallic Smith. He assembles the final shirt, but you can easily kit him out with a workshop that is feeding yeah. him the rings to mm -hmm. do it. And he, and then those guys eventually will be well enough trained to make their own shirts. Like this is a production capacity that you can potentially expand fairly rapidly. The mail will never be cheap, but if you're willing to put the resources and the labor in, you can produce a lot of it. Mm. Right. So that that's that really, you get to a point where you go that the, the Roman army from the early third century and the late third century looks even more different than we sometimes think. I mean, it just uh, by the end, not all of them in mail, perhaps, but most, but very many. Very many. Um, yeah. Now they all have a the Gladius Hispaniensis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're still having the, the same helmet, probably, but. So, um, yeah, 
I All mean, the there war are... games were going to have to redo their armies again. Yeah. yeah. No. More specific. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to re, I'm going to have to redo all my goals because I I have I have mail too wearing, much mail. Well, I have mail wearing mm -hmm. infantry in my Gallic army. Uh, well, I mean they can always yeah elites. dismount dismounted elites yeah yeah absolutely, I mean, absolutely. They, they, sure, there you sure go. Enough. But um, but yeah. Do you do you think that mail remains? I mean there was there was a time that Lorica segmentata is regarded as the as the new technology the the better armor that replaces mail. And yet we kind of get mail consistently um, throughout the archaeological and, and representational uh, record to say that mail never goes away and that mail's probably the most dominant form of armour throughout the Roman Empire as well. Um, do you do you think that or is that, is that out of your period? Do you, are you the, the no, Tata is a cheap uh, uh. replacement rather than an expensive one? I still kind of scratch my head at the segmentata, to be honest. Um, so, I mean, so certainly we keep pulling mail out of out of Imperial Roman sites, despite its its sort of dismal preservation. Um, it is not just sites associated with auxiliaries. Like a lot of, I see a lot of sort of wargaming models, and the auxiliaries mm -hmm. are in mail, and the legionaries are in the Lorica segmentata, and it's like, no, it's not that clean. Um, you know, the column of Trajan is propaganda, folks. Um, uh, one thing that's worth noting about distribution, our segmentata finds are almost all in the west of the empire. They're almost all on the Rhine Danube frontier or or in the British Isles. Um, we find mail in those sites too. Um, we find some scale armor, but relatively little. In the east, we find buckets of scale armor along with mail. And so you have this situation where, and of course, roughly half the Roman army is in the east, roughly half the Roman army is in the west. The tricky thing with the east, of course, is that it's less excavated. Obviously, Dura Europus is very important, but, um, you know, there are lots of places that we can't really be excavating right now um, if you don't want to be barrel bombed by the Syrian regime. Um, sorry if that was too on topic. Um but um, but it does seem like there's a regional variation. For me, that's bizarre because I would expect the regional variation to go the other way. The Lorica segmentata seems to be good protection against arrows, but I'm sure there's a reason. I I just haven't puzzled it out. But mail seems to coexist in both cases and seems to remain quite common. In terms of the relative status of the segmentata versus the, the Lorica hamada, an obligatory note that while Lorica Hamada is a phrase that appears in our sources, Lorica Segmentata is a modern invention phrase, um, though a useful one. Um, it's always striking to me that you know who we never see wearing the Segmentata? Centurions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're always wearing male or scale. And that makes me think that the segmentata may be the cheaper alternative, but then the weirdness of auxiliaries who should almost certainly have a lower status armor being in the Lorica Hamada next to legionaries in the segmentata is confusing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but then you have their centurion wearing the Lorica Hamada um, with all of his cool medallions. Yeah, exactly. It goes better with all his medallions. Or, or, or the muscled cuirass that goes back to, you know, Right. century BC Greek right. heroic depiction. So when you say we're seeing this, where are we seeing this? Because if we're talking about artwork, then you know a lot of that artwork is going to be produced in you know the urban setting as such yes. by artists who aren't necessarily out in the field actually seeing what proportions right. are in terms of who's wearing what, and so therefore again we come back to the you know th that stereotype as right. such just pr put forward now by the the artist who wants to put up, you know, a nice little column in the middle of Rome or something. So, <laughs> and you know. this is, this is, of <laughs> nice course, little column. nice little column. Um, yeah, well. uh, having been there, it's a nice big column. But no, I think, I think you're exactly right. And especially in the empire where, right, at least in the Republic, we can imagine that the artist in Rome putting together, for instance, the so-called altar of Domitius Ahina Barbus date question mark question mark the 200s maybe question mark question mark um fun arguments there um uh but um 
But definitely from the Republic, right, that artist has to know that the people in Rome know what their soldiers look like because we still have a conscription-based army or we're very early in the in the volunteer post-Marian period. Um, you know, they're going to know what, what that looks like. By the time we're in the Imperial period, right, the aver- what does the average citizen of Rome know what the armies on the Danube look like? The yes. other thing, of course, we need to be aware of, even if the artist is... Like, even if he did trek out to see what the legions look like, um, the two big fancy columns we have are both for wars on the Danube. They Mm. reflect the legions on the Danube, which is why the Lorica Segmentata is so prominent, because it was common on the Danube. But it isn't on the reliefs, uh, on the end of inclusive reliefs. Yes, Mm. exactly. Um, and, and it's not common in, in what we, yeah, in what we see out of, out of the East, right? It doesn't show up in like graffiti from Dura Europus and this kind of thing. Um, the segmentata is less common out there. And so, you know, if Trajan had made his column campaigning against the Parthians, um, you know, we might well have had, uh, a column that had a lot more scale and we would have seen a lot less of the Lorica segmentata. Who knows? I think I'm right in saying on the, on Trajan's column, I think the most accurate representation is actually the Praetorians in terms of their equipment and uniform, I think, from what well, I recollect. Well, as far as we know. Uh, mm. Yeah. Well, Basically and of course, because they are present in the in the city of Rome as yeah. well as uh, out, in, out in the battlefield as such. Well, and of course, the necessary caution that high-status people and high-status mm. armors always get more attention. Mm. Mm. I see we're almost coming up to an hour. Let's see, let's see, you know, is there any evidence for how useful all this male armor was? I mean... It gets introduced real quick. Presumably, there was they, they saw an advantage to all that. Right, right, and um, yeah, there is sort of the mute testimony of its rapid spread. But I think we can do we can do more um, with that. One of the things that's been um, moving along in the experimental archaeological space is efforts to test armors. Um, that testing is typically directed towards thinking about medieval battlefields. Um, but the convenient thing for us is that medieval mail is the same structure and style as Roman mail. It, it, the fabric of the mail, right, the interlocked rings don't change very much at all. Um, so the tests are probably still valid. Um, what that kind of testing and reconstruction can tell us, um, mail is slightly heavier than other armor alternatives, but only a bit. And its weight is better distributed. So you're not really losing much in the way of of sort of weight, it's not much heavier. Um, It is much more flexible than other alternatives. So you're gaining in mobility, the ability to turn and bend in the torso is much better in male. So you're probably overall, the mobility in male is better than contemporary alternatives, muscle cuirasses, the linothorax, which is very stiff uh, as reconstructed, Um, even probably something like the um, chest protector, if it's worn in that complete style harness, um, you know, male has, the other big advantage male has is coverage. Um, all these parts of the body that are hard to armor because they need to move and turn, male can cover them. And so, you know, you look at your muscle cuirasses, they terminate at the waist and the, the pelvic area of the groin is covered by paturgase, hanging leather straps, which one wonders how much good they did against a spear thrust or an arrow strike. Some, clearly, but not a lot. Male can cover that area completely down to the knees. Maybe they're called feathers for a reason. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right, right. No, um, entirely fair. Um, and so the coverage balance of male is a lot better. So then if the blow strikes male, what's going to happen? Um, some experiments have been done um, uh, with this. Um, there's Alan Williams's book, which has some flaws, The Night in the Blast Furnace. There's a recent article actually by David Jones um, in the Journal of Medieval Military History just uh, a year or two ago, doing more experiments with this. Um, the, the sort of the upshot, um, one-handed or two-handed, no amount of strength will ever let you cut through the iron rings of mail. Um, if, you're, if you're cutting with an ax or the edge of a sword, uh, you might break a bone, you might bruise somebody, although mail and the layers of padding worn under it are going to absorb a lot of that impact anyway. Um, you just, ru- you've just ruined every ancient and medieval movie on a warfare ever. <laughs> yep, ever. Nope, you just can't do it. Um, there's no amount of, of human strength that's going to get you through. The, your best bet, if you're cutting, um, is even, you can. You not can. Even the rock. Not even, not even the Gibson. rock. Not, oh I know. 
Heavens, heavens for them. <laughs> um, you're, you can damage the mail this way. Um, if, if you're applying a lot of force, it can burst the rivets, um, which I guess if you keep hitting somebody in the shoulder and they let you will eventually degrade the armor. Um, presumably after the second or third time, though, they might hit you back. Um, with a thrust, you're better off. Um, at the upper levels of what is possible for a human to do, a sword point or a spear tip can be driven through mail. Penetration depth is going to be more limited because a lot of the energy is used up getting through the mail. But in both sort of um, simulated tests and also uh, practical tests, sometimes done just by enthusiasts on YouTube, you can do this. But you do need a solid hit. Uh, it can't be a glancing hit. It's got to be a solid, hard hit. Um, anything less than that, and you're not going to get through. Arrows are trickier, tiny contact area, lots of impact energy. Um, arrows have a decent chance of getting through. It's not perfect, um, but there's some chance. Uh, this is really relevant in the medieval context where you have English longbowmen and Mongols everywhere. Um, for the Romans, of course, they have these giant shields that cover their most of their body. Um, and for an arrow that you, is coming from far away and you know the angle it's coming at, you can just put your shield in the way. Um, that has interesting implications for the battlefields the Romans find themselves in in the second century. Um, because mail has never been widely deployed before, by and large, the weapons of the battlefield have not adapted to defeat it. If we fast forward to the late Roman period or the Middle Ages, we find all sorts of weapons that appear tailor-made to defeat mail. Nice, thin stabbing points on, for instance, relatively short swords, like the later imperial type gladii, I think would defeat mail quite handily. I think that's what they were designed for. Um, narrower spear tips, arrows designed to penetrate mail with these sort of railroad spike style um, rectangular cross section points that look like someone mounted a giant nail on the end of, of the arrowhead. Um, those are all designed to defeat mail. Those are not in common circulation um, in, outside of Italy in the second century. And so um, your options are limited. For a Gallic warrior facing a Roman, the good news is that if he gets a good square hit, his spear can get through mail, though it's going to be tricky and hard. The bad news is that his sword, which by this point we're looking at the middle of 10 swords, which are pretty dedicated cutting swords, is basically useless. Um, he's left having to try and strike the unarmored parts of the Roman, which are obviously things like the face and arms, which are hard to hit, um, uh, and the neck, which is also tricky to hit and guarded by those shoulder pads we mentioned to a, to a degree. Whereas, of course, the Gaul is relatively unarmored. The Roman can land his Gladius Hispaniensis anywhere. Even if the Gaul is an elite wearing male, the Gladius Hispaniensis has a nice stabbing tip. Um, so he may be able to put it through the armor, for instance, in something like a gut shot. Um, as we move into the, the east, there's an interesting sort of dichotomy. Of course, your Hellenistic phalangite in the phalanx, he has two weapons, right? He has his sarissa, he has his pike. Um, just looking at its shape, it should be able to go through mail, and our sources tell us it does. Um, so good news, if you're in formation as a Macedonian phalangite, um, your weapon works. Um, bad news, your pike is 21 feet long. If your formation breaks down, this weapon is useless. You're going to drop it and draw your sword. You have two options for swords. Um, you have the coppice. Um, it is a dedicated cutting weapon. It basically cannot thrust. This is the forward curving mm -hmm. blade, the one the movies all use because it looks cool. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it does look cool. It's a brutal cleaver. Uh, a really solid cutting sword, um, also popular in Spain uh, as the Falcata, basically the same weapon. Um, very effective um, as a cutting weapon, but of course the Roman you're facing is basically immune to cutting weapons. So that's useless. Um, you're stuck in the same problem the Gaul is. You have to strike an unarmored portion of his body, whereas his weapon works all over you. Um, you're going to lose that fight, especially because he also has a bigger shield than you do. Um, the other option, which you had to choose before you came to the battlefield, is the Xiphos. This is the straight-edged um, Greek sword. This can thrust, but it's not really ideally designed for it. It's a, um, a wasted sword. That is to say, if you start at the bottom of the sword, 
it the blade curves inward it thins and then thickens to a bulge about two-thirds of the way up and then thins again to a point the gladius hispaniensis is very slightly wasted but xiphoi are quite strongly wasted that wasting moves mass to the point of percussion on the sword, which puts the mass of the blade where you would deliver a cut, which is great for a big, strong cut. But by moving the point of balance forward off the hand, it makes it harder to deliver a nice squared off strike that you're going to need to penetrate mail. And it also means that the tip widens more rapidly, which means you need to burst more rings to get through. So the Xiphos probably can do the job, but it's not very good at it. And then on top of that, we have the question of training. You know, we know Hellenistic soldiers train, but if there are two swords on option for them to train with, and one only cuts, and one both cuts and thrusts, what do we think they spent the most time drilling on? I have to imagine that a lot of these guys are going to resort to their training and cut with their Xiphoi. And, and that's assuming that that they do a lot of training with it anyway, because right. they have to that practicing keeping that enormous pike um, pike um, mm -hmm. information is going mm -hmm. to require most a lot most of training, of training presumably. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, we have two really interesting casualty reports from Livy um, at Pydna and Magnesia, and one of the things that connects these two battles is that the fiercest fighting seems to have occurred after the, the Hellenistic Macedonian in one case Seleucid in the other formation had broken down. So at Pydna, right, we know the, uh, it's a hard battle to reconstruct, but um, the Antigonid Macedonian army advances, it meets the Romans, the front Roman line, the Hastati, don't dislodge it, they fall back, the Macedonian formation gets discombobulated, the Romans attack a second time with the Principes, and they win and the slaughter on the Macedonian side is terrible. Um, the, what Livy comments about this battle is really striking is that the number of Roman dead is extremely small, a couple hundred, if I'm remembering correctly. But then he stops and does something unusual for Livy, which he notes there were quite a lot of wounded men. Um, and what I think is happening here is a situation where once the fighting got to swords, once the formation broke down and the Macedonians are forced to rely on their swords, you're getting a lot of Romans who are getting, you know, dislocated shoulders and bruises, but the cuts aren't getting through their mail. And so the Roman soldier is bruised or has a broken left arm or something, but the Macedonian he's fighting is dead. Hmm. Um, hmm. Likewise, at Magnesia, where Livy gives a very similar sort of casualty report where he remarks on the unusual number of wounded, um, we know that. Um, right, the center position between the Seleucid phalanx and the Roman sort of stalemates. The Seleucids win on one flank, the Romans on the other. Uh, really, the Pergamum allies win on the other. Um, the Romans aren't really there. Um, and the Romans capitalize on this to envelop the phalanx. And the phalanx initially forms square, fights its way off the field to its camp, and the last of the battle occurs as the Romans storm the camp, and both Livy and Appian note that this is the fiercest fighting at Magnesia, is storming the camp. Well, of course, fighting at a rampart, you're not going to be able to use your 21-foot pike there either. And so it's amazing. The Romans storm a camp full of, ma of Seleucid soldiers who are fighting them, we are told, um, and yet take remarkably few losses and lots of wounded. And to me, this was actually what brought my eye to studying to studying mail and sort of asking these questions because my brain went off and, and to the reports that we were getting in the U.S. in 2004 and 2005 um, when the Department of Veterans Affairs was being asked why its hospital system was falling apart. And their answer was, well, we didn't expect so many survivors. We expected these guys to be dead. Well, why are they not dead? Well, because we deployed all of this new body armor among U.S. infantry, and so they're wounded. And so we have to care for them. They have these terrible wounds, but they're alive. The body armor saved their life. And so the light bulb went off and I asked, could this be what's happening in these battles? That hmm. these are situations where the Roman hmm. body armor has given them the edge. The Roman soldier has survived and his Seleucid or Macedonian opponent hasn't. And I, and I think when you look at the weapons that the Seleucid or Macedonian has to fall back on, yes, I think that is what hap that's what's happening. That's certainly what I'm arguing is what happened. You, you guys can decide whether or not you're convinced or whether you think I'm full of it. <laughs> well, I think, you know, there are, there are later battles where the, the casualties are so 
one-sided. Um, you know, I think is at the Battle of Strasbourg where Julian's army loses seven. Um, right. And, and know, we may ask some questions <laughs> about those figures. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that the on the one hand, you've got one army running away generally and the other mm -hmm. army pursuing, so they're not getting fought against. Right. Uh, and secondly, the idea, you know, even Marathon, 192 right. uh, Athenian, mm -hmm. um, is not a vast number of, of casualties for that number of troops deployed. Again, we've got the problem of the sources. Right. But, but also um, a battle with yeah. a likely severe armor mismatch where, mm -hmm. you know, if you're looking at the weapons that once it comes to close combat, once the Athenians are through probably quite deadly arrow fire, um, the, the, you know, the, the weapons that a, a Persian soldier, uh, you know, he's probably better trained than his Athenian opponents, but the weapons he has are not designed for a hoplite. Um, if we assume I don't want to um, open the can of worms of the hoplite debate as to whether we are dealing with a phalanx at Marathon, um, you know, Hans von Wies will jump out of a window and attack mm -hmm. me. Um, uh, but Actually, we had an article, I think, arguing a couple of years ago that the Persians may have had better armor, that there's a contrast being set up there, but that's a whole, whole different story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's a, that's its own argument, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think we've discussed. Well, we have. We've only started to discuss the introduction of of male in the Roman army, um, but we keep our, our podcasts are getting longer and longer lately. Right. So, uh, <laughs> it is my unfortunate job trying to keep them uh, within some kind of time limit. So, uh, I would like to thank you uh, very much, Brett, for uh, joining us, and, and maybe you can come back later and we can talk some more about arms and armor uh, in Roman and Hellenistic armies and uh, and all that good stuff. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. This was a ton of fun. Thank you. Thank you guys. And um, see you all later. <laughs>